Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, Pastor David Taylor Black here, and I'm coming to you from my home in Ledbury, but as the pastor of Kiln Church. We launched Kiln Church last Thursday evening with a time of worship, following many months of um, prayer, reflection, and the Lord's leading. Now, if you want to be part of Kiln Church, you can connect to us via our Facebook and our YouTube channels, where you'll find regular uh, content updates, notifications. Currently, as a church, we meet once a month in Ledbury Community Center and socially at other times. But the exciting news is that we are expecting to meet weekly from September. And in between all of that, we'll be live online at four o'clock on Sundays to study the scriptures together. And I'm here today to start and to kick off a series in 2 Peter, which we've called Finding Hope in Dark Places. So I want you to go off and run and turn to your Bibles, get your Bibles and turn to the towards the end of uh, the New Testament. If you've gone to John, Jude or Revelation, you've gone too far and you'll find Peter around there. Now, whilst you're dialing that up, just to say if you've got any questions or comments to make or you want to keep in touch, you can email me on david.taylorblack at kilnchurch.com. I'll try to put on a link at the end of this message. So, eyes down, got your Bibles open to 2 Peter. And uh, I'm only going to speak from two verses this afternoon because... I just think so often we glaze over the introductions, but there is an awful lot of gold in these verses. So, 2 Peter chapter 1 from verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord. So that's all as far as we're going today. Um, we welcome Peter. Peter is a guy who Jesus had a beeline for. He clearly had a special relationship with Jesus. And, and many of us have a real uh, affection and affiliation with Peter. We love him because we see traits within ourselves that we see in him. You know, he was typically cynical. He was zealous. He was a hero, but he was also a little bit of a villain. He was an ordinary guy, a natural leader who had become discouraged with organized religion. And here is the awesome truth is that God chose him. And this is so poignant because we know what that means for all of us, that God can choose us. Too. Or if we were to put it in Paul's words, God chooses the foolish things of this world to shame the wise, the weak things of this world to shame the strong. To many of us, we feel that we are just simply not good enough for God. You know, we don't feel that we measure up. We might struggle with sin. We might not know our Bibles well enough. We might not do church enough. We don't have the gifts or the confidence. But when you look at most of the characters in the Bible that God called, they were as fallible as we are. You remember Noah, he got drunk. Abraham failed God, failed to learn lessons. Jacob lied. Moses stuttered. Joshua was timid. Jonah ran away. David committed adultery, amongst other things. Elijah was burned out. Jeremiah was a depressive. Timothy doubted, along with Gideon. Paul persecuted the church. Mark bailed on the missionary journey. Timothy was too young. So I want to say you must never underestimate how God can mold a lump of clay and shape it into a beautiful vessel for his purposes. I've come to learn that you must never put a ceiling to what God can do with you. Forgive me for saying most of us, I guess, are pretty ordinary. We may be even just average at best, but God is an extraordinary God who calls people to do out of the ordinary things for him. You see, what God does, he equips the call. He doesn't call 
the equipped. And the only requirement that we need to give of ourselves is a heart that is willing and pliable, a heart that can echo perhaps the words of Isaiah when he said, here I am, Lord, send me. And it was when Peter saw that miraculous catch of fish the morning after he would spent a night on the Sea of Galilee catching nothing when he was all in for Jesus. And I guess off the bat, I want to ask the question, do you believe that you are all in for Jesus? Through the Gospels, we, we read a lot about Peter. We read um, perhaps his pinnacle moment was when he declared Jesus as the Messiah. Following, um, uh, uh, following that, the Lord said, upon this Petros, upon this rock, he will build his church. You know, another highlight for Peter was that sermon at Pentecost, which saw over 3,000 people give their heart to the Lord, That where he was boldly convicted by the Holy Spirit that turned the hearts of many and raised the early church. And Peter, together with his close friend John, they, they greased, the, they turned the wheels, greased the wheels of the early church. But then after a little while, he just fades away a little bit from the limelight. We get to Acts chapter 12, and following that, we don't read much more about Peter. It's just snippets of his life for, for the rest of his life. And we start more to look at Paul and, and how he led um, and birthed the church amongst the Gentiles, as he was called to be God's instrument to them. So there's about 20 years of radio silence. Um, but then just at the end of Peter's life, he makes a resurgence with resurgence with two short letters. And we're going to study the second one probably for about five weeks. And Peter's big theme here in 2 Peter is finding hope in dark places. When the world is about to cave in upon you. We all need to hold on to something to pull us through, whether it's going to be another wave of COVID later on this year or the, the economic squeeze that we're all feeling at the moment or whether there's going to be some kind of fallout from uh, the war in U Ukraine, whatever it is, everyone needs hope. And um, From what, what Peter says in verse 14, Peter knows that he's uh, about to face his, his execution. And Peter knows he's on the way out. Peter knows that he's about to, to meet the Lord. You see, Peter is, is writing from Rome. He went to Rome perhaps to encourage the early church that was being birthed there. But whilst he's there, he's arrested. And, and, and from this moment in Peter's life, it's around mid-60s um, AD. Um, this is about to bring on a, a torrid time for the early church as persecution from the imperial Roman Empire heats up at the hands initially at uh, the... Uh, at, at, the Emperor Nero. So Peter is writing at a time when the church is actually on the ropes. The ruling global empire has got its hands around the neck of the church and the church were the scapegoats for the great fire that happened in Rome. So they, many people became martyrs um, f and it happened for over a period of 200 years um, simply because they wouldn't bow down to the deities of Rome. Now, were it not for the divine providence, pres presence and protection, the early church just simply would not have survived. So what Peter does here, he, he's writing a, a word to give encouragement, to say that no matter what happens around us, God will always have the final say. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. All history, past and future, falls within the bookends of a transcendent God who has stepped down into our humanity and revealed himself to, to us as saviour and as shepherd. Now, it wasn't until 313, with the Edict of Milan, that persecution of Christians by the Roman state ceased. But the total number of Christians who lost their lives during this time is completely unknown. The historian Eusebius says there were countless numbers or, or myriads who lost their lives, who having perished for not uh, renouncing Jesus. 
Now, it wasn't until the fourth century when Constantine the Great came into power and in 313 he legalized Christianity. And a short time later in the fourth century, Christianity, can you believe this, would become the official religion of the Roman Empire. Now, someone tell me that God is not in ultimate control of all things. When life looks bleak, the only thing we can do is look up and believe. So Peter is writing to a church that is that is on its knees. It's weak in its own strength, like dust. It could be just blown away on the wind. No matter how big one's army, no matter how destructive one's artillery, it cannot destroy faith. Faith that is built on the work and the teachings of Jesus is bulletproof. Our hope, the Christian hope, is eternal. So Peter's goal in writing is to establish faith, to strengthen the church, to encourage steadfastness in the face of struggles. And so Peter opens up then, eyes down. He opens up by introducing himself as Simon Peter. Now, it's intriguing to me. Here's a little tangent. Why he refers to himself as both Simon and Peter. Peter, of course, is the name that Jesus gave to him in Matthew 16. Yet Simon is his birth name. And the point here may be a tenuous one, but I think it's important. You see, Peter doesn't attempt to erase or dismiss his life before Jesus. Now, of course, there are things in, in his life and in our lives that we need to need to die in us. But there are other things where there's this sense of continuity and continuation and I call this we, where we need to sanctify the secular you see God calls you and saves you where you are to be a light to those around you be that as it may Peter goes on to call himself describe himself as a doulos I'm a, a doulos a servant Peter Peter for all his status and privileged position with Jesus he might have said that he is the Lord's right hand man but he doesn't do that Peter wants to be referred to nothing more than a slave a servant the Greek word doulos it carries a deep meaning it's not just servant it who would turn up for work the word can also be translated as slave now Peter was quite clearly a slave to Christ, he bound himself to his master, not under a, a, a sense of command, as most slaves were, but under conviction. Now, our goal, our goal as our pilgrimage in Christ is to arrive at that place where we can say we have enslaved ourselves to Christ, becoming a doulos, a servant of the master. You know, growing in Christ is to become a doulos of Christ. And, and the truth is quite plain to see. You either become a slave of Christ or a slave of this world. Peter also refers himself in the opening verse there as an apostle. Now, apostles were, were commonly known as those who had seen Jesus. They'd been in the presence of Christ. Um, and Paul, Paul, if you think of him, he refers to himself as the last and the least of all the apostles. So in a in a literal sense, there are no more apostles. Yet the function or the gift of apostleship continues. According to Ephesians chapter four, the gift of an apostle is mentioned first. You've got the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, uh, the shepherds and the teachers. But that apostle is first gives it primary importance. And apostleship today, it looks like. As it did back in the first century, breaking new ground, as the early church did, planting churches and starting new ministries in those areas that are spiritually dry or where there's an absence or a lack of an evangelical gospel presence. And, and Peter, he, he's addressing here uh, those who have obtained faith. So it's likely that his audience are, are Gentiles. Now, what he is doing here is he's he's. he's in this introduction, he's putting everybody with faith on the same page. And he, and he acknowledges that faith is given as a gift, Ephesians 2 verse 8. And John writes that we're born again, not by the flesh or by the will of man, but as a result of the gift of God, John 1 13. Now, faith is a gift and we know Hebrews 1, it's impossible to, uh, sorry, Hebrews eleven six. it's impossible to please God without faith. Now, 
a lot of us Christians, we, we tend to narrow the definition of faith to some kind of intellectual belief system. But faith, as the author to Hebrews wrote, is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. So therefore, faith enables the dis disciple to live confidently, even in a crisis. And you might have that picture of Jesus when he was lying asleep in the bowels of a boat when the storm was raging. That's what faith can do. Now, Peter says something else quite powerful. So he says, having obtained faith of equal standing with ours. Now, this is pretty awesome. Peter doesn't put himself or anyone else on a pedestal. Those who were once not a people have become a people of equal standing by the will of God. Now, Peter wrote in his first letter, we're going to revisit it another time, that, that Gentiles are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Now, the Bible speaks of Gentiles being grafted into the vine, Romans 9. And today, Christians, whether they are in Ecuador or England, we're all of equal standing. There are no super apostles. There are no special saints. And, and Peter wants to get this message across. You see, in a world where lines of equality are becoming more and more segregated and polarized, the church are meant to be one. Born not out of uh, a wishful thinking, but born actually out of what Peter says next. The righteousness of God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, Peter is starting to take us into salvation territory here. You know, and the first thing that we learn, no matter how clever, smart, we, capable we are, there is nothing that we can do to be right before God in our own standing. It's the old truth, but it's worth repeating time and time again. We could not earn favor with God. No amount of tears or tantrums or talking can turn God's gaze towards us. Now, here is the gospel. It's good news. To be right with God depends not on what we have done, but it rests solely in the cross of Jesus Christ. And that is, my friends, good news. And to use biblical language, if we take Paul's writing to the Corinthians for our sake. God made him who knew no sin to become sin so that we might be, as Peter writes here, the righteousness of God. And Peter is reminding his audience uh, salvation is from God alone. It's a gift. So no matter what hand we get dealt with in life, faith not only levels us, it unites us. So when one part of the body is hurting, we're all hurting too. Now look what else Peter says in, in this introduction. Uh, straight off the bat, this is really good if you want to take notes. He refers to Jesus as God and Savior. Here's a proof text to the deity of Jesus right in Peter's um, introduction. Now here's that mystery that Jesus can be both fully man who looks like us, etc., and yet he's fully God. We we say 100% man, 100% God. That's not 200%. It's just a mystery. Because when Jesus came, when, the, when he came as the incarnation, he didn't give up his deity. He was God incarnate, as the prophet said. Search the annals of history. There is no other claimed deity who has walked with his people and then died on their behalf like our God and Savior Jesus Christ. You know, he's not just one in a collection of saviors, as Acts 4 says. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to man by which we must be saved other than that of him, Jesus Christ. And Dr. Luke, he, he uses such urgent language. You must be saved. Why must you be saved? Or you face the judgment of God for sins not paid for at the cross. Now, verse two, following Peter's identification comes his intercession. Now, this is common in, in most of the New Testament letters, an opening prayer of blessing. Peter says, my, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Uh, and what Peter says here, this is awesome for many reasons. 
you know, I remember a few years back, uh, pre the troubles of COVID, I was at Fre a Fresh Streams conference and Roy Goodwin, who wrote Grace Outpouring and, and led the uh, retreat center in Fowler Brennan, uh, he talked about the importance of pronouncing blessings upon people wherever you go and wherever you you are not just the people that you know or the people that are in need of prayer, but anyone and everyone. And I think you should go and try this. Go around praying prayers of blessings upon people. And now you can quote the Aaron, Aaronic blessing in number six or Paul's Trinitarian blessing in 2 Corinthians 13 or make one up yourself. But this prayer of blessing, it opens up something that we may not have unlocked before. The potential for the multiplication of grace and peace in our lives. So what does that mean? It means that there are vaults of this stuff up in heaven within the heart of God that remain untapped. Every disciple should be mining for more and more grace and peace to invade their own soul and the soul's of the people around them. God is never depleted of grace and peace, and it's a well that will never run dry, that can never become bankrupt. Put your hands up if you could do with more grace and more peace. And so we're all doing that. And it seems to me it's these things that are absent from people's lives at the moment. And there is a way to simply increase in great measure, in measures of multiplication, this grace and peace in our lives. And Peter explains it. He says, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Now, listen, in the knowledge of God and Jesus, our Lord. You see, grace and peace is a condition of the heart that is formed by the knowledge of God. Knowing God through Jesus, who we know in Hebrews 1, 3, is an exact representation of the Father. And this is the key that unlocks grace and peace. Peace from above surpasses our understanding and grace from above equips everyone through every storm. And that's what we all need. And that is why it's hope in the darkness. So knowing Jesus, it doesn't help you escape the storms he enables you to dance in the rain and it comes down to simply to to a simple equation knowledge changes the heart and that's what paul meant when he said be transformed by the renewing of your mind you know there's a slogan isn't there no god and no peace that's no K-N-O-W, no God and K-N-O-W peace, or no God, N-O, God and no peace, N-O peace. And that has always been true. Now, hearts that are full of grace and peace are able to praise him even before the breakthrough. That's why Paul and Silas, remember when they were imprisoned in Philippi? They were able to worship God. Why? Because their knowledge of Jesus was so great that it instilled grace and peace in their hearts so that they could sing and praise God through the breakthrough. And when, as a disciple, we go through the storms of life, if he can see and hear his saints praying and worshiping God, then the, the vaults of grace and peace have been multiplied unto us. Remember the context that Paul Peter's writing into. The church were about to begin three centuries of persecution by the Roman Empire. So Peter is praying for these two spiritual virtues to invade the church so that it might have the hope to withstand two to three hundred years of hell. So knowing Jesus is the anchor of to our soul in any situation. You see, if you try to find peace in anything else, it's like trying to hold sand in a sieve. It just doesn't, doesn't happen, you, it won't work. Grace and peace come from above through a relationship, an intimate relationship with him. You see, notice what Peter doesn't pray for. He doesn't pray for the persecution to stop or to be evaded or for uh, Rome to be destroyed. He simply prays for more grace and peace to be multiplied. 
So when you pray for people, uh, you pray for people in their situations, perhaps you pray for yourself to overcome, to be drawn out of a, the darkness. I think that's absolutely fine and we should do that. But I also suggest that you add that you would pray for more grace and peace to be multiplied to the one who is going through uh, the fires of hell. I'm going to take the wisdom of Roy Goodwin and pray a blessing over you in a moment that as you press in to him, grace and peace will be multiplied into your lives through through a knowledge of him. And, and that will birth a faith to you that is worth more than diamonds. We're going to continue through uh, chapter one next week. I'm going to try and keep these talks to around about 25 minutes. And that's a bit of a struggle. So I tend to speak double as quick. I'll, I'll try to uh, over correct that. Um, but I hope you've been able to take something out of that today. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to be able to speak uh, to you, whether you're watching online or whether you're going to pick up this a little bit later. Um, if you do want to get connected with uh, Kiln Church, um, uh, go on our social media pages. If you want to write me uh, and get in contact with me, I think there's my email address. You can uh, jot that down and uh, I'll be glad to uh, reply to you as and when I can. But for now, let me pray. Let me pray for that multiplication of grace and peace that will restore your faith. Father, we thank you that you are a wonderful God, an incredible God who provides that grace in our time of need, a grace that is sufficient for us for all circumstances. We thank you for that peace that you grant to us that um, completely um, eclipses our situations. It surpasses our understanding. And Lord, I pray now for, for saints uh, listening on who who are going through a struggle, who are concerned about certain situations of life. Uh, we're all concerned about uh, what's happening in Ukraine, what's happening even on our shores with the economic crisis, we might call it. And, and I pray, God, that, uh, people are still concerned about COVID too. And so I pray, Lord, that you would um, help us to press into you to get the right knowledge of you so that that faith might increase and Grace and peace may be multiplied to all of us. And we ask and pray these things in our precious Saviour's name, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you, everybody. Thank you for uh, tuning in. And I look forward to seeing you next week. We'll be sending some stuff out on E-News from Kiln Church. So do keep in touch with us. God bless you all.